Hey folks, welcome to the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. In this episode, I have a great interview for you with uh, Nino Brown, who is an activist, organizer, and former educator. Uh, I think Nino is a very cool guy and has done some very cool stuff. Uh, we talk about his work, as well as black activists and leaders like Fred Hampton, and why we don't see leadership happening so much these days. I apologize to you, the audience, because parts of the audio is for this are very bad. Uh, there was something interfering with the audio and I couldn't clean it up without ruining all of it. So I hope that uh, it's still good enough that you can listen to it. Uh, this happens sometimes and it's unfortunate. I still think there's a lot of good stuff in this interview and I hope that uh, that comes through. Uh, you may have noticed recently that I've been using the same intro for uh, the last few episodes. That's partially because I think new listeners uh, and viewers should know who I am. Uh, if they want to follow this show, and also because I haven't had time to write and record new intros lately. I'm still playing mental catch-up uh, since working a ton of overtime, and that means that I was a lot of what I was hoping to do hasn't been done yet. <clears throat> I'm hoping in the future to explore anarchism a bit in a, a kind of my version of a video essay, and after I'm done that, I'd like to explore other ideologies and ideas in a ways that makes left or progressive politics accessible to people unfamiliar with uh, the texts and or history of it. I'm also still planning on to do many interviews and I, and I have some recorded and just waiting for editing, but I also have some lined up that uh, I, I hope, I also have some lined up and some that I'm, I'm hoping I'll be able to get to soon. <clears throat> with all that said, uh, I'm just about to send you to the interview, but first there are uh, so many ways that you can support this channel and this uh, podcast and all the other projects I have on the go. So go look in the show notes or the description box to check those out as, as well. Uh, my Patreon is patreon.com slash skeptical leftist and I deeply appreciate any support you can send my way. Uh, big thanks to my new patrons, Jared and Sean, and a thank you to Kim for increasing your pledge. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment, contact me through any social media platform or by email at uh, mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com or use the super cool contact form on my brand new website, which is skepticalleftist.com. And with that, on to the interview. All right. Hi and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Nino Brown. Thanks for joining me. Peace. Glad to be here. Right on. So I guess a good place to start, uh, I know you do activism and stuff, but uh, maybe if you could start just telling the audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Nino Brown. And I'm an organizer with the Anti Coalition, uh, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism Coalition. Uh, also a member of the Jericho Movement, <clears throat> Movement to Free Political Prisoners, and I'm a former educator, public school educator, uh, and union organizer. And I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Okay, cool. Like, uh, what? Uh, how long ago did, were you an educator? Um. <clears throat> so. Uh, I, I was in the classroom as soon as a year and a half ago. So I, okay. I've, been out of, I've been out of the classroom for about a year and a half now. So what got you, uh, what, what brought you out of that? Um, I mean, you know, I love being in the classroom. I love teaching. I love education. Um, <clears throat> but the pandemic really took a toll on, you know, myself and the entire industry of education, there has been a remarked shift in the pace of the work, the, the, the actual weight and amount of the work, and students are academically severely behind. Right. Um, reading and math levels and skills are just significantly lacking, coupled with lack of institutional support. You know, uh, there isn't really a democratic or, you know, a uh, progressive really solution that's being proposed for education right now, but just, you know, go back to school and act like everything is normal. But uh, right. there's actually a lot of, a lot of things going on in schools that are in need of a lot of att attention and help. 
Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> it's uh, it seems to be the project of uh, many state state like institutions to defund public education. It's uh, like the backwards way of doing things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's you know how capitalism goes. They want to cut as many costs to the production of you know people. Uh, save alone production itself, you know, always cut corners. How do you make it cheaper? How do you make it, right. uh, you know, less costly? So that means more labor is being put into the plates of teachers, of the workers. Uh, you know, as capitalism goes on, you think that we would, you know, uh, because of the high productivity of labor, we would have a shorter working day you would have, you know, hired more and trained more workers such that you would have ended unemployment and could, you know, rationally, democratically distribute the essential tasks of survival uh, and reproduction in this country, you know, but instead teachers are, you know, given, you know, extremely big classrooms for a single teacher or even two teachers to have on top of the deficiencies, right? The lack of uh, resources, the lack of extracurricular activities, the pushing of testing culture where kids are just being, you know, shoveled into schools to be tested. All they do is take, to take a test to tell them that they are not smart enough. And then because of that test, they don't get into, you know, so-called better schools. And right. these, tests, these tests become, you know, destiny. It's almost like a ticket for what your future could uh, portend or hold. Um, so yeah, you know, being in the classroom is difficult, so uh, I plan on getting back into the classroom, but right now I'm taking a step away from it. So, yeah. Oh, that's, that's fair. Um, so what have you been active in since uh, since then? Uh, I mean, I've just been organizing um uh, as a member of the PSL and, you know, organizing with the Boston Liberation Center, um, organizing, you know, uh, study circles, you know, uh, and speeches and writing more, um, but also, you know, uh, holding protests, recently held protests um, for the release of the Tulu Shakur. Um, what else? Uh, you know, celebrating commemorating Black August. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's been, uh, been really just organizing um, and, you know, pretty much doing the same things that I was doing before, except just not have more time to do it. Right. No, that's, which is good. That's, <laughs> it's good to have people that are, that can actually commit themselves to, uh, to actual projects. It's I think that often we get stuck in our day to day grind, trying to make ends meet. And then it, it takes away our energy from doing any kind of activism. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what the ruling class wants, right? Uh, if if it was up to them, you'd be working twenty four hours a day. Yeah, right? uh, but uh, that's why the twentieth century, you know, the slogan of the labor movement was like, for the eight hour workday. You know, eight hours of work, eight hours of uh, you know recreation, eight hours of rest. And the struggle for the workday, you know, it's a significant struggle under capitalism because we're struggling, you know, not just to get higher wages, but to literally get more time outside of this exclusive place called work so that we can actually be ourselves, you know, uh, or, you know uh, whatever we may like, right? Because that's when you're at least alienated and you're not at work. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I... I work, uh, my job is like, I work 12 hour shifts, but it's seven days on seven days off. So I bang out 84 hours in seven days. And then I have a week off to do the rest of things. <laughs> so it's pretty nice compared to like the average person who actually has to work like every se five days a week or six days a week. I'm pretty lucky, <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, you mentioned, uh, your part of act now uh so what is that what does act now do uh so it's actually, it's actually answer, answer coalition. coalition 
Um, um, it's an acronym for this Act Now, now to Stop the War and Racism. Uh, so um, the Hitler Coalition was an anti war, anti imperialist uh, organization coalition that came about after the, after the, 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 the September 11th, 11, 11, you know, 2001 attacks tax, um, uh, on the United States, States on, on, on the Pentagon and the World, World Trade Center. Trade Center. And, 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 you know, you know from, from the very beginning, beginning the coalition. coalition uh, fought against the, the imperialist and intervention in Afghanistan, in Iraq, Iraq, Iraq uh, uh, all of the Middle East, the East, 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 Basically, right. in the U.S. 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 Uh, and, uh, and after the, 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 the election of election Barack Obama, 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 where some where folks felt that he was some type of peace candidate, uh, the anti uh, anti will shift and shift. You know, the anti coalition has been, been, been continued to play a instrumental role in you know, the anti war and anti terrorism in this country, country, country um, uh, because it connects and connects the struggle against racism and the struggle against imperialism. Before it was more and more. There's always, There's always propaganda, propaganda that has to has to repeat repeat the minds mind of, of people, people, masses to get them ready, ready, ready to accept, accept, you know, war, war. Whether right. it's, you know, you know, argue from the left, or both argue from the right, right. right. Uh, you know, you know, for the war against Russia, there has to be a demonization of Russia. For the war against Chinese, there has to be a demonization of brave Chinese, Chinese. For the war against Venezuelans. That's the demonization, demonization, right? Right. right. Demonization is right. 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 sometimes very, very racist. racist. Uh, uh, and, and you know, you know, we connect, connect the struggle against race racism to the struggle against the world because we realize that racism, 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 ideological justification of of war, war. The race country government are lesser than they can become themselves. We, we, the civilized United States, right? We're so good at ourselves. And, and we have the best guys in the world, world, so we have, so we have to teach each other how to ask ourselves, which more often than not, and not end up, end up, you know, with chaos, chaos, and we'll migrate, migrate to this, to this country, country, because we destroy, destroy our, with our good governments. So, and so, it's the organization that, uh, you know, fights, fights against those things, things, um, in the broadest, broadest sense. So, I guess, uh, that's, that's one of the organizations you're involved with, but also you're with uh, the Jericho Movement, which is, you said, uh, working to free prisoners. Yeah, the Jericho Movement is a movement to free political prisoners. And, um, you know, it's distinct in that it, uh, is, one, it is the only organization um, that was founded by political prisoners to free political prisoners. It was founded by Jalil Muzakim, and Safiya Bukhari and Jalil Muntakim uh, and Safiya Bukhari are former members of the Black Panther Party, uh, members of the Republic of the Africa, uh, as well as, you know, uh, members of the Black Liberation Army. And Safiya Bukhari uh, passed away in the 2000s. Um, and, you know, she uh, she wrote a, a good book called uh, The War Before Report. I encourage everyone to check out that book. Uh, you know, I think it's, I say that Sophia Bukhari is the Asada Shakur that we had and did not really kind of know or appreciate while she was here. Um, and Jalim Sakim, you know, he was incarcerated for some 30 to 40 years, uh, uh, framed by the U.S. government, you know, their wow. COINTELPRO, uh, and so many other Black Panthers <clears throat> and, you know, socialist leftists, communists, et cetera, were framed by the U.S. government, thrown into jail for years, for nothing but just having, being a radical. 
uh, being a revolutionary. Uh, and he recently got out of prison in 2017, I believe. And since he's been out of prison, he's been able to, you know, continue organizing uh, and continue to build the movement to free political prisoners, but also fight for justice. Uh, and, you know, I think it's important to uplift and highlight our elders because, you know, the reason that we have political prisoners is because the United States government once wanted to and wants to disconnect us with those who struggled before us so that we will have a much more difficult time figuring out how to struggle today, where it feels it feels like we're constantly starting over, right? And the reason is, well, they've killed, assassinated, jailed, uh, harassed uh, so many of uh, those who chose the same path that we chose of revolutionary struggle uh, and tried to incarcerate them because they felt like their ideas and their whole personages was was dangerous to their social order. But it is Black August, like I said, uh, and Black August is a month to commemorate, you know, uh, our fallen Black liberation freedom fighters uh, throughout the entire diaspora. And um, yeah, the Jericho organization, I know we have many comrades behind bars and many people to commemorate. Um, it seems like <laughs> the state, uh, like they don't feel as threatened now as they once did. Like, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm missing the news on, on a lot of it, but it seems like a lot fewer people who speak out now, or maybe there's too many people who speak out and they can't assassinate all of them. <laughs> it seems like it's, we're, uh, we're not seeing as many people taken down by the state, uh, because they feel threatened right now. I don't know. Maybe they're too sure in their power or something. Yeah. I mean, as far as the state and, you know, whether or not it feels threatened or not, I mean, I think, you know, well, one, what is the state? You know, the state is the organized uh, body, the organized violence, the bureaucracy, the law, the police, the courts, the prisons. Um, and, you know, those things are constantly expanding under capitalism um, because the struggle of the workers is always constantly expanding and poses a real threat to the ruling class. Uh, but also the danger now is that, you know, the state itself is corporatized, you know, essentially privatized mostly, uh, where <clears throat> those basic functions, uh, are now corporatized, right? They're run by corporations. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, so what, so that, that's what the state is, you know, as I understand it. And I think as far as like whether or not, they feel threatened. Uh, I think there's a potential threat. If we look at the 2020 rebellions, we we had Minneapolis City Council, uh, Minneapolis politicians, the mayor, you know, pledging, agreeing that they were going to abolish the police because you know people had just burned down a police department. Yeah, uh, people, you know, had had, had marched and protested and raised hell in the streets for weeks, if not, you know, uh, months. And because of that threat, we saw that Derek Chauvin was arrested. He was jailed. It was a long, drawn-out trial. But uh, that was only done because of the threat that the state felt. Because, well, then maybe the, maybe another police station would get burned down. And then another one. And then... You know, you kind of have this escalating uh, struggle. So, uh, you know, it's really, I would say that they, the, the state constantly feels, it's his job to feel threatened by us. Um, but as far as the threat increasing, I think, uh, I think the threat is always increasing given, you know, the fact that the contradictions remain unresolved from climate change to environmental racism to education, you know, all these are uh, powder kegs, right, waiting to explode. Um, and the ruling class, that's why they invest in police and prisons because they, they know that there's a threat of an uprising and they're going to need, the only way that they can maintain their order is through repression. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, we have, like, uh, seen nothing but in like despite the rhetoric we have seen nothing but increased budgets for policing and and military and and 
all these things that were supposed to go, supposedly going to get defunded when that was what the public was wanting. And instead, the, the, they got more money. So, and in, they were expanded, like you say. So, yeah, it seems like, like you say, like the threat to the state and to the, the corporate power, the ruling class, it is always uh, expanding. We have, we see it more all the time, it seems like, where people are joining unions and, and realizing that they're, that the state of the world now is unsustainable. So more solidarity, I guess, is what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, it's yeah. interesting to mention, you know, you know workers know, unionizing, unionizing because uh, the peak unionization rate in the United, United States had never been more than like 30, 30 40%. 40%. Um, we um, never even got to 50% of this country. country. Uh, and, and we have one of the most bloody and violent island. Labor history is from the history of labor, labor right? Uh, if you look at the Molly McGuire bugs, the Pinkerton bugs, uh, the way that you know, capital was just, just you know, churning out people's lives, putting children to work, uh, people losing bodies, body parts, uh, you know, company funds being hired to shoot down striking workers on top of the intense segregation. Uh, of the working uh, class, class, you know, by relegating black, black, black uh, uh, non white workers to uh, second, second tier, tier you know, uh, citizens, uh, and, and thus uh, driving wages down. Because you can always, you know, like, like tap into that, to that super exploited reserve. So, so when you look at labor history in the United States and the rate of unionization, it's taken an intense amount of oppression in order to maintain the abysmal physical conditions that you've survived for so long. But, but, but uh, the hope that we see today is that there is a potential to revitalize labor movement, labor movement because these places, places that we're told were unorganizable, right? right. Uh, uh, Starbucks, Starbucks, how are you going to organize Starbucks? Starbucks. The, 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 the shop is shop small, small, right? right. It's not like you're working in a factory. factory and you're right. working in a brain that is institutions with just lots of workers, right? If you're working to a Starbucks, you know, it's maybe yeah, like five, five people, 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 six, six, maybe seven, seven, seven right, right. Uh, uh, Amazon, Amazon, people thought we could organize Amazon. 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 Uh, and Walmart, 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 Walmart is there. Walmart, 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 the working class has you know, growing, growing, being employed in this you know, service, service uh, uh, industry, stream, put back the tech and tech industry. industry right yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it's heartening to see, like you say, the small shops being organized. Um, uh, I live in Canada, so it's a slightly different situation, but they're organizing in, in Canada as well, Starbucks is. And uh, I, work, I work in uh, the oil industry. So... But it's, I also work for a small company. So it's nice to see a small company of like six people uh, organizing a small location. So then I think, well, maybe if I could, you know, if I could communicate with my coworkers, we might be able to have a kind of a, a, a union as well. Or dear boss, I'm not joining, uh, starting a union at work. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, like the idea is that we could work together and like be have solidarity with each other instead of uh, just placating our boss all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think the rise of a small shop shop, uh, uh, is, is necessary, necessary, right? Right. right. Cause, Cause our class class is not, not, not where we're simply yeah, simply we're organized. Organized. <laughs> and, and a part of, part of the, uh, you know, the categories of class large, large, they are, are that study, that study struggles, struggles that we're in the context and it's one thing that they're very is that kind of trading workers, workers in, in, in the workplace, workplace is dangerous, dangerous because when you have a concentration of workers, 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 you have a uh, concentration of social, social power, power where, where all of the workers are now control, control, control whether or not production, production occurs at all. at all. And the production that you occur in the profit is made. And, 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 and if you have these work concentrated and all of the controlled production, production, you know, whatever the situation is, and it's, you know, ideological production, production rules. Uh, uh, you know, commodity, commodity production, production, production uh, many all different all types of production, production, production uh, uh, reproduction, reproduction. Uh, but, but, you know, if they, they stop, stop working, working, then, then 
Yeah, it's uh, um, before the next uh, question, I'll get you to reconnect your microphone again, <laughs> and then uh, and then I'll I'll ask you like we were gonna talk a bit about uh, uh, before the show we've talked we mentioned you mentioned Fred Hampton and uh, today being his what would have been his seventy fourth birthday, so I wonder if we want to talk a little bit about uh, him. Yeah, yeah, um, um, definitely, definitely Fred, Fred Hampton. Hampton. Um, he was, he was today's, today's his birthday. birthday. He would have been 74 years old. Years old. Uh, Fred, uh, Fred Hinton is, uh, was, uh, was a chairman, chairman of the Black Party, Black Party, Black Party, Party in Chicago. Chicago. Uh, 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 Fred, Fred Hinton was a legend. legend. He was a uh, 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 pillar. Like, like you. So yeah, Fred Hinton was really a, a pillar of the Black community and a defender of oppressed and working class people. Um, and, you know, like I said before, uh, Fred Hampton started off very young. When he was, you know, 16 to 18, he was a organizer, a lead organizer uh, of the NAACP. Uh, and then he joined the Black Panther Party. Um, he graduated from high school in 1966 uh, with honors. And, you know, uh, he was actually hoping to play center field uh, for the New York Yankees. But instead, he had a, a different vision, which was, you know, to... A fight for freedom for the black community. And, you know, uh, while he was in, he began college, he majored in pre-law uh, to get familiar with the legal system so he could use it as a defense against the police. Um, but, you know, once he, he gave up these kind of bourgeois and petty bourgeois uh, dreams, in a sense, and became an organizer uh, of Chicago's poor and working class people, um, and once he joined the Black Panther Party, he, you know, had a very charismatic and meteoric rise. Uh, the time that he joined was in a very pressing period, you know, or, or the peak of his activity was in a very pressing period. Uh, Malcolm X had been assassinated in 1966. Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. Uh, and Fred Hampton existed really from 1966 to 1970. 
And, you know, I mean, Hampton, uh, he was a bona fide working class leader who was able to unite poor working class uh, people across, you know, races and nationality into a so-called rainbow coalition, uh, which was, you know, a, you know, a working class united front of all the uh, oppressed and exploited communities in the United States. Um, I think one of the main things that I always uh, take and, and honor about Fred Hampton is his emphasis on the importance of political education uh, and not just, you know, uh, whitewashed, you know, capitalist, bourgeois education or just an accumulation of facts, but political education to really help to form people's consciousness and help to, you know, form them as, as thinkers, right? Uh, if we understand <clears throat> that our task as revolutionaries is to turn thinkers into fighters and turn fighters into thinkers, Fred Hampton was a huge proponent of that. He believed that, you know, every Black Panther should study. Every Black Panther should uh, uh, go through an educational program before they join the party so they know, you know, the history, but also the analysis and, you know, kind of what they're fighting for. But obviously, you know, political education is a continuing thing and not just something that ends. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Hampton was all about that. I mean, I could really go on about Hampton. But, you know, Fred Hampton was assassinated by the Chicago police uh, in coordination with the FBI. Um, and, you know, uh, his house in Chicago still is actually being turned into a historical and memorial site. Uh, so, yeah, happy birthday, Fred Hampton. Uh, Fred Hampton presenting. Nice. Yeah, I, uh, wasn't, I wasn't aware of Fred Hampton until I entered into... Uh, like listening to leftist podcasts and stuff. And then uh, I got a bit of an education on uh, first how he was assassinated by the police and the FBI. And then after that, then I learned about his politics and his activism with the, with the black Panthers and the rainbow coalition. And uh, obviously a, a person uh, to admire and, and, and look, look for, uh, wisdom in what they say, what he said, like, uh, he had a lot of, uh, there's a lot of quotes out there from Fred Hampton that a person can, uh, can take to heart. And, and his actions also between uniting various groups and his leadership of, of the Black Panthers at the time, it's, he's a person that we should all be looking, looking up to, I guess is, is the way to do it. Yeah, I think we should be studying the example of Fred Hampton, but also uh, the social conditions that produced him. You know, as as a Marxist, uh, we understand the role of individuals in history, uh, and we don't believe that history is ruled by individuals. That individuals just you know change history whenever they want. But in looking at any historical leader, we got to look at the the times that they were raised in and the historical conditions, uh, what was happening. And Fred Hampton was really born in a very, he was born in, in, in organized in the apex and the height of the transition from the civil rights movement into the black power movement, which he kind of epitomized in his own life itself, right? Moving from the NAACP, which is very liberal and conformist, into the Black Panther Party, moving from you know, maybe studying law or pre-law into now organizing uh, cop watches and people's defense organizations against the police in the police state. Um, you know, so I think that, that, you know, Fred Hampton really epitomized that transformation and continued dedication to uh, study. And I think we should study how he lived. Um, you know, he didn't live very long, but... In 21 years, he was able to teach us so much about what does it mean to be a revolutionary and to be dedicated, uh, and, you know, like he said, to fight for the people and to live for the people and to ultimately, you know, die for the people. Yeah, for sure. I wonder, like, I guess it's hard to say, like, are the conditions we live in now, uh, is this a moment where we will see a, a kind of a revolutionaries, uh, coming forward is this 
Because sometimes it feels like there's a lot of change happening, but also sometimes it feels like there's not enough people leading us or, or stepping up into a role of like actually doing anything. Well, I mean, I think the crisis that we face today uh, is a crisis of leadership. If you look at the social movements that have been going on in the last decade or so, uh, they felt faced by a crisis of leadership. If you want to go back to the Battle of Seattle in 1999, you know, where there was a global, you know, somewhat of a global uprising uh, starting in Seattle uh, against, you know, neoliberalism, against uh, globalization. Uh, it was very disorganized. It was, it was decentralized to the point that it could not land a strong blow on the enemy. It's the difference between landing a haymaker punch and you know, a bunch of knocks on the chin. Uh, you can knock the enemy on the chin as many times as you want, so it's maybe confused and distracted. But what we want is a unified haymaker and uh, you know, knockout punch of capitalism. And it's been difficult to organize that because of the uh, residual effects of the fall of the Soviet Union and the disorganization of the entire international left. Because after that kind of event, a lot of the left went into uh, hiding, went into, you know, gave up, believe that socialism is no longer possible, revolution is not possible. And that's what the ruling class uh, put forth as well. They said that it's the end of history, that history cannot develop beyond capitalism. Right. Uh, most that you can hope for is capitalism with a green face, capitalism with a human face. And uh, uh, part, part of that is uh, uh, mitigating or, or, or to, to agitate against socialist organizing, right? right? If you're saying that socialism is a pipe dream and it doesn't work or you shouldn't try it, then essentially what you're saying is socialist organizing is useless. Uh, so it's very in the career where there's a revitalization of socialism because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law of history where people are oppressed and exploited. Uh, they're going to search for tools, tools, search for concepts, search, concepts, search for, for, you know, frameworks, frameworks ideas that, that, that people who want to be free, free look for to fight, fight, and historically, it's going to be science, science socialism, socialism, or whatever you want to know, you know so-called, so et cetera, et cetera, uh, Marxism, uh, Marxism, you know, Marxism, and, Marxism. And, 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 you know, you know, we're actually, we're actually, actually learned a lot of these lessons, lessons, and that's trouble again, right, 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 what's the Communist Party's party? Uh, and uh, what, were they, what were they doing in the 1930s? 1930s? Why do we have a media uh, What is the role of the real kind of party? What is the state? state? Uh, we're, we're almost, almost because we have to, uh, you know, we're, we're actually trying to try to build a continuity uh, that yeah, has been destroyed from the 1970s, from the 1970s uh, uh, to this day, day. Right, right. If you look at, look at the rise of Hazekanism and, and the reactionary, you know, the reactionary, the Christian fascist movement, the nationalist movement, movement, all of that came from the Benjamin Swan soundtrack, away from the radical 60s and 70s, you know, that's the battle of history that just looks one back, back, and, and, you know, we have been recovering, recovering, still since that day, or since that time. So, so, I think the scene of the the leadership, leadership, uh, you know, I'm in a revolutionary party, and, and, you know, uh, we did that say party, 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 you know, you know, uh, um, we train, train, to be the best in the struggle, struggle, where we operate at, and, and, you know, no, I think, I think we should all be talking about the task, task, especially before, as well as uh, because every class has produced the two leaders, you know, every class has produced the two for him, for him. Right, right, I thought it was the so and so. You want to be on right? Right. And if they ever produce their use of the most gates, gates, we need to be just a divine vibe for the hyphen and such as our American Mexicans. Because so and so, they're out there, out there, but they're not organized, right? They're not organized, they're there, they're there. Some of them don't even know each other, each other, right? Right. So it's a very fast, fast, but easier, easier to do in approaching their tasks. Being a part of organizations, whose goal is to accomplish the task task of building, building, organization, actually dividing body, part, part that that can provide provide us some guidance, guidance, some type of direction, direction, some type of pull, some type of shift, shift, 
I had direction to direction or 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 class 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 I, I just, uh, I sometimes, I see like things that I think are really going to bring about a lot of change. Like you say, like the, the 2020 protests and, and uprisings and, uh, and you wonder like, how will, like, is this going to last? Can we maintain a motivation, a ma- ma- momentum to keep going? And it seems like it, it, it always fizzles out, especially when there was such a push to get everything back to status quo post pandemic, right? Like everybody, like so many people on the right and, and the centrists, they all push against any kind of progress because they're trying to like get everything back to business. They want everything running as, as it was before. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, the dialectics of history, right? Is that the ma- the masses of people cannot be protesting in the streets incessantly. Uh, there can be disruption only for so long. Yeah. Look at the Egyptian revolution, uh, people protesting in the streets and got rid of, uh, the, you know, the Egyptian government. Uh, but they had no alternative. They had no, there was no plan. So then the military took over. Yeah. Right. And now you're back at square one. Uh, and it really shows really the need for more leadership. Uh, and the task of revolutionaries is to look at, you know, every situation and say, well, what is to be needed? What is needed and what is to be done? Uh, because it, you know, it was the biggest protest movement in the United States history. 35 million people took to the streets. Uh, there were, there were places that were run by the Klan. You know, the New York Times ran an article. I remember it was saying that in towns that were essentially run by the Klan, at every single level, uh, education, police, hospital, everything. Uh, the children and grandchildren of these clan members were protesting, uh, you know, for Black Lives Matter or what have you. Right. Um, you know, most of these protests that took place all over the country were multinational. Uh, it wasn't just black people. There were 60 uh, cities uh, all, over, all over the world that held protests in solidarity with the uprising in the United States. So, you know, uh, it, it was a qualitative shift in the level of protesting and what's been happening. But the, the point is that all of that is energy that will dissipate, right? It's, it's, it's energy that will dissipate if there isn't sufficient organization, if there isn't sufficient uh, revolutionaries and cadres and, and leaders that are embedded among the masses and can actually lead folks, you know, in and lead them towards something, right? right. If we don't lead them, the ruling class, they are built to mislead people. They will lead people back to the election booth, back to, you know, nonprofits, back to the status quo. Yeah. And that's their job. You know, we, we can't really get mad. It's like, that's their job. They're the ruling class. Of course they want to maintain their status quo, right? No ruling class has ever overthrown <laughs> itself. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think we forget that it's it's our job. If when we see these things in the movement, uh, it really just speaks to what, how much more we need to do. Like, yeah. we have a, a big task ahead of us, uh, and you know, I think for the U.S. left, for the North American left, or Western left, I think the main thing is that we have to recognize that we cannot become obstacles to ourselves. You know, uh, reaching our class because. Uh, like I said, it really is a battle for ideas, and the pendulum is going to swing back, right? It, the pendulum cannot swing and then just stay there on the left. It has to swing back, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you be ready for when it does swing back, because right now we're in an ebb. You know, right now it seems like reaction is dominating. Nothing, nobody's protesting. Nothing's happening. Yeah. But there's going to be a time when something snaps, and we have another 2020 on our hand, and then it's going to seem like, wow, this was going to, I knew this was going to happen. I knew it any day now. I knew it was going to happen. Right. But during these periods of quiescence and uh, periods of political ebbs, I think the work that we do here and now of building and connecting and strengthening uh, our movements and relationships is crucial so that when there is another point of uprising, we're stronger. Yeah. And all the critiques, all the critiques that we had before, we can actually, we should be correcting in the next time. 
No, that, that makes perfect sense to me. It's, uh, <laughs> if, if we're, you know, we're on a downturn. So this is where we build our solidarity with those that are still active and those that are still trying to organize. And then, like you say, come back later <laughs> when our ideas, our ideas are more popular, when we can be, uh, actually do something. But, uh, we're, we're at about 45 minutes. Um, normally this is when I would ask somebody about, uh, foes and comrades. I, I'm not sure uh, if you have any that you might come up with off the fly, but, uh, if, uh, if not, then we can move on to the closing of the episode. Yeah. Foes. What is, I mean, <laughs> foes are then the ruling class. I mean, that, I mean, I won't say, I one I will say is, uh, Senator Ed Markey, shame on him for taking a delegation, uh, to Taiwan, uh, you know, some time ago, about a week or so ago, uh, amidst Nancy Pelosi's ill-advised, uh, trip to Taiwan, which mm. only angered, you know, Ta- uh, Chinese, Taiwanese people, uh, and, you know, it was unnecessary. You know, it was against, I mean, nobody in the Democratic Party was asking her to go. Right. In fact, you know, Mike Pompeo and the diehard reactionary pro war hawks, you know, who hate China in the, in the Pentagon, they were like, yes, you know, gung ho Nancy Pelosi, let's go. <laughs> and, you know, Ed Markey, he is someone who claims to be a progressive, claims mm. to be for the working class, uh, you know, actually is the child of immigrants and does have some working class background in history in Massachusetts. However, uh, he's now a part of the, the state apparatus, the ruling class state apparatus. And for him to take a delegation to Taiwan uh, after Pelosi did is really just beating the drums of war. It's completely unnecessary. The United States policy is to recognize that there's only one China. Uh, in fact, the United States is going against their own, their own recognized policy that that's the whole reason that they've had relations with China for the last 40, 50 years. Right. Is because of the policy that recognizes that there's only one China. Uh, so for them to really play dumb and act like they don't know what's going on with, you know, that Taiwan's a part of China and to send delegations to instigate, you know, problems there. Uh, and then at home say that you're for the working class. Well, how does working class benefit from war with China? Yeah. Like inflation, yeah. prices will go up, people die. Like what? Like Ed Markey, you're not a progressive, you know? Uh, that's, uh, I was just reading something uh, about uh, George Sorrell, uh, who was, I guess, uh, an anarcho-Marxist. He was kind of a, a mix of the both. And he he said something about uh, uh, socialists or progressives in the parliamentary system actually just uh, prop up the conservative side of things. They, they actually placate the conservatives. They don't, uh, prog- they don't actually push progressivism. Or, or socialism. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, as a Marxist, uh, I am fundamentally opposed to billionaires like George Soros. I don't think that yep. he, any, <laughs> you know, any kind of Marxist uh, or any type of progressive. And I think that he is a part of the same ruling class uh, that Obama, that Bush, that all of them are. They're all part of yeah, the same yeah. club. You know, like, I think that's one thing to not forget is that they're all a part of a class, a clique, a group that, you know, they, when it, when push comes to shove, they will unite with each other more than they will unite with us. If you look at the Paris Commune as an example, you know, the French ruling class, they hated the Russians. But when the Paris Commune came about, they said, okay, we're going to ask the Russians to help us to, to yeah. fight off this, like, working class resistance. So, uh, you know, uh, anarcho-Marxism, down with, down with it. George Sor- Soros, down with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, George Sorrell. Sorry, I didn't say it. I didn't pronounce- oh, Sorrell? <laughs> so- oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> down with it. <laughs> I think I know who Sorrell is. He uh, wrote that uh, text on uh, Guerrilla Rip- Warfare in Latin, Latin America, right? Uh, I, yeah, I can't remember. He wrote one uh, about... Uh, uh, revolutions in violence or something it was his yeah uh, he uh from yeah 
early 1900s. <laughs> just just reading on my my history these days. <laughs> so nice, yeah. But yeah, so it's. I guess we're at 50 minutes, so I guess uh, shout outs for comrades. Um, I mean, I want to give a shout out to Matulu Shakur, who is uh, Tupac Shakur's stepfather, who is in prison. Uh, it's been about 38, almost 40 years now, and uh, he uh, has been given six months to live, uh, probably has maybe four or you know, less months now to live. Wow. He has bone marrow cancer. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, United States federal government is not uh, granting his compassionate release, uh, even though his co-defendants were all granted compassionate release uh, several years ago. And incidentally, they're all white. Uh, and, you know, people know Tupac Shakur, but his stepfather's in prison. And, uh, you know, he's suffering. Uh, and, you know, he did a lot for the movement. So, you know, shout out to Tupac and shout out to uh, the Jericho movement and all the folks that are trying to free political prisoners uh, because, you know, any one of us could become political prisoners. We got locked up. And who's going to fight for us if we get locked up, right? Yeah. We have to make sure that we fight for those who, uh, who whose, whose footsteps we walk in. So shout out to Matula Shakur and shout out to the Jericho movement and all the organizations out there that are fighting to free political prisoners. Very cool. Well, uh, I guess the only thing left is where can people find you and uh, your content? Um, you can look me up on uh, Instagram at New African, uh, on New African Nino, uh, and Twitter, same thing, New African uh, with a K, Nino, and on Facebook, Nino Brown. Um, and, uh, my organization is the PSL, the party for socialism and liberation, PSLweb.org, uh, the Jericho movement, uh, the Jericho movement.com and intercoalition.org. Um, and yeah, uh, that's, that's where you can find out about me and, or, you know, follow me on social media or find out about the organizations that I, I work with. Yeah. Right on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Peace. All right, folks, that's everything. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical, skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics. Uh, you can check out the videos that I do with my friend Damien Maria at Hope and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. You can also find the links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. Uh, you can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for watching or listening, and try to get involved with something in your area. And let's all work to make the world a better place. 